Divine Truth Interviews Jesus, Mary and others are interviewed by members of the media and the public. Jesus is interviewed by Mary Magdalene on the topic of Divine Truth. The interview was held on the 21st of August 2013 in Wilkesdale, Queensland, Australia. This is Session 1, Part 1. This series of Frequently Asked Questions is about Divine Truth. And divine truth encompasses so many different questions. I think altogether we've been asked quite a few hundred questions about divine truth and about what we mean when we talk about divine truth. And so this series of uh, questions is discussing all of these particular things. What, what myself and Mary mean when we're discussing divine truth, but also what other people question about divine truth itself and also what other people question about the organisation that we've created called Divine Truth, so, which are all different things, really. So, but this series of questions will answer all of your questions with regard to these particular matters. You'll find that there are a lot of quite involved questions during this series. It's one of the most important series, I feel, of any, that anyone needs to answer, the question about what is Divine Truth. And uh, the only other thing I think that is more important that we need to answer is what is love and what is divine love, what is God's love. And so those two series of frequently asked questions will be placed on video over the coming months. So we'd like to welcome you along to these series of questions and hopefully you enjoy the answers that we give on this subject of what is divine truth. Okay, darling, how are you today? Good, thank you. <laughs> I'm excited about this topic. It's yeah. one of my favourites. Yeah, it is, isn't it? Yeah. 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 All right. So let's get, get started. started. Okay. Mm. What is divine truth? Well, that's the most important question <laughs> of this series, other than the question, what is divine love? Yeah. So I feel what is divine truth is such an important question to answer. So the answer is that divine truth is God's universal truth. Now that sounds very um, almost religious in its nature, but it's not. The reality is God's universal truth is always logical. It is always scientific in its, in its nature. It is always mathematic, mathematical in its nature. It always um, is based on the reality, but not human reality. It's the reality of how God sees everything not the reality of how we see everything, because that's often imaginary rather than reality. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Divine truth has a lot of qualities and attributes, and we're going through this series to discuss the qualities and attributes of divine truth. So rather than me mentioning them now as in part of what is divine truth, let's look at a few of the attributes so that we can understand what it means. Firstly, one of the attributes of God's truth is that God's truth is infinite in its nature. And because God knows all the truth, humankind is only ever going to be in this process of discovering truth. And we will keep discovering truth for the rest of our existence and still not find out all the truth. So any book that claims to be the beginning and the end of all of God's truth is totally illogical mm -hmm. right from the beginning. So the Bible itself claiming to be the end of God's truth um, aside from some comments in Revelation, of course, it depends on your interpretation, cannot be logically true because God's truth cannot be contained in a book. In fact, the truth about the human body can't be contained in a book, let alone all of God's universal truth be contained within a book. So we need to understand that, that divine truth is far bigger than most people on this planet and most of humanity imagine. It's even bigger than most people who have passed over into the spirit world imagine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it is a, it's going to be a constantly growing and constantly changing thing because God's universe is constantly growing and the dimensional existences in God's universe are constantly changing. So there will be always this discovery of more and more truth. And this is fantastic because what it does is it gives us, humanity, this beautiful desire to discover more and be involved in the process to, of discovering more, knowing full well that in the end we're not going to be able to discover everything and that's what's going to keep our life very interesting and enjoyable all the way through the rest of our existence. So we need to stop seeing truth as a finite thing that once we've found it out that's all we need to know because that's not how it's going to be in our discovery of God's truth. 
And since God is the maker of the universe, God knows all the truth about the universe. We, as a finite being that God has created, have the capacity to discover truth, but we can't expect to know all the truth. Mm -hmm. So God's truth isn't contained within a man-written man book, and it's not contained within any individual, actually. It has to be something that individuals discover. And so what you and I believe is divine truth is God's universal truth, which we have yet to discover fully. And in fact, our belief is we have yet to discover a minute part of that truth, given the fact that we're going to have an, uh, an infinite existence and you and I have been existing only for 2,000 years. So in terms of that period of time, that tells us that we've found out very little of divine <laughs> truth. So when we share divine truth with others, we're just a sharing from our personal experience the things we've discovered that we know for certain are God's universal truths that can be proven by fact. They are factual. They're not something that is just imaginary or based upon faith alone, but rather the reality of experience, uh, scientific in nature, mathematical in nature, logical in nature, but we realise that we've discovered very little of it. And this is what we want to share with people. We want to share with people that the discovery of divine truth is going to be an everlasting process. Mm -hmm. And what we need to do is understand how to discover divine truth in order to discover more and more of it in a more simple manner. And I have discussed before with people in other questions that the way to discover divine truth is quite simple in that we're better off talking to the creator or finding a method of communication with the creator in order to discover truth than we are trying to experiment in order to discover truth. So what most people do when they try to discover truth is they experiment. What we're trying to do is, is do the greatest experiment, which is this experiment with God, getting closer and closer to God and therefore discovering the truth that God knows. And so by you saying others... Um tend to experiment. You mean in the classical sci scientific method where yeah. people create a hypothesis and test the hypothesis. Using and... some kind of experimental, usually some apparatus, but also based upon what they have had faith in about before. In other words, they might have had, for, for example, if we look at different methods of experimenting, basically what we've done is we've got a body of what seems to be evidence, and then some new person comes along and and then he discovers a new way of discovering evidence. For example, you know, people like Galileo in history discovered new ways of discovering evidence. Mm -hmm. And in, in the an analysis of the universe, he realised that the Earth did not, the Sun did not rotate around the Earth as it appeared, but rather the Earth rotated around the Sun. Mm -hmm. And this, of course, was a major confrontation to the religious viewpoint of the day. And that means that the religious viewpoint was false. And it had to change mm -hmm. because there was a discovery of a new scientific fact. And whenever a new scientific fact is discovered, that is God's truth. And therefore, whatever we believe has to conform to it eventually mm -hmm. at some point in the future. OK, so <coughs> I want to just clarify this point that you keep saying it's scientific in nature. Mm. What you're meaning there is it's scientifically provable. It's, yes. It exists in reality and it's not yes. a matter of conjecture or interpretation. So exactly. God's truth is always like that. God's truth is always like that. So, uh -huh. and, and, uh, and that doesn't, and just because a human cannot prove it given their current belief system, it doesn't mean it's non provable. Yes. Because, you know, for example, once we die and we pass and become a spirit, we have a lot more uh, of the universe available to our, to our testing, in our testing abilities, in our experimentation. Yeah. And as a result, a lot of the things we believed when we were on Earth, we, we now expand into new beliefs once we pass because we see a whole heap of new things happening through our personal experience. Mm -hmm. so, so this is where p humans have got to be very careful what they do when it comes to discovering truth. What most people do on Earth is they basically don't believe anything they cannot see. And this is a very, um, like I, I feel it's a very foolish thing to do because there are so many things we cannot see. Mm -hmm. We cannot see the basic building blocks of atomic structure, for example, with our human eyes. And yet eventually we get to see them through processes, through the discovery of apparatus that we can test these particular things. And it's exactly the same with regard to things about the spirit world. 
things that we have personally experienced can be proven. You just need the right apparatus. You just need to know the backgrounds of it all. And, and this is where I feel the majority of people um, don't, don't understand the truth about God's truth. Mm. Everything is provable. God's always wanting to share everything about the universe with us. It's just whether we're willing to go through the process of being humble to what we don't know. Yeah, and I suppose within that you're also saying, when you're saying things are scientific and mathematical, basically what I glean from that is that everything in God's truth is governed by a set of logical laws. So everything. even if we haven't been able to, even if we don't know it, it's still existing. Exactly. And there is processes, there are processes that we can engage that will involve logic and understanding a certain set of laws which will lead us to truth. And which would lead us to mathematical justification of that particular logic and truth and right. scientific justification of that particular logic and truth. Uh, I suppose because a lot of people would say, well, some things are scientifically proven. People might say it's scientifically proven that you don't have a soul. or the, and that, See, I don't, that, that is not the case at all. Yes. And, and, and in and fact, like, I, I think nobody, in fact, would probably claim that. No, I was, <laughs> it's probably a bad example. Yeah. But there, I, I, I suppose what I'm trying to discuss with you is that um, there are some things on earth that people believe are, are proven to be false. Yes, I, I don't, see, I don't know about that. Like, right. I feel there are some people who believe those particular things are proven to be false. That's but universally, there are some things that the whole of the earth has now accepted as true and very few people accept as false. Yes, I see. Uh, for, for example, the, the, the earth is a sphere, is now an accepted truth in the majority of the planet. There are very few people now associated with any per type of discovery of anything going on with the planet itself that believe that the earth is still flat. Mm. There are some people that do still. Mm -hmm. There is, in fact, still a flat earth society. But, but it, they are very, very much on the outer when it comes to scientific evidence. Sure. So what happens generally in the discovery of truth, and there's a process of discovery of truth, and that is nobody knows it, mm -hmm. then one person knows it, then a few people know it, and then eventually the whole the whole scientific community knows it, and then generally that's taught over generations to the whole world. And, and that's generally the process. And once the whole world knows it, then it's very, very hard to shift it if it actually is wrong. You know? so, yeah. so, for example, in terms of religious studies for thousands of years ago, there is this belief that the earth was flat and that was... Or, or more so, so, the Bible and most of the books mention the circle of the earth, but uh, more that the earth, uh, the, there is this religious viewpoint that they wanted everything to revolve around the earth. So, mm -hmm. And we know that's not the case. The universe doesn't revolve around the earth at all. The earth is just a tiny little speck in the universe. And, and we've discovered that through the discovery of apparatus where we can measure those particular things. And this is the case with all of God's truth. We, we discover more and more ways of finding out the actual truth. And initially, there's one person who comes along and says this is the truth, and everybody laughs at them. Some historically, they've been put in jail. Historically, they've even been murdered mm -hmm. for doing for doing the, for for saying something that the general population doesn't agree with. Eventually, the truth will always win. Mm -hmm. Eventually, what happens is the whole population eventually accepts those truths, no matter what happened historically. So, would you say that's another quality of God's truth? Of course, the truth doesn't conform to humankind's ideas or concepts and uh, and in fact humans will have to bring their concepts into harmony with all of God's truth sooner or later. So so yes that's one of the qualities of divine truth. Divine truth does not compromise with regard to human concepts. It doesn't try to conform itself to the ideas and belief systems of humanity. Mm -hmm. In fact it's quite opposite of that. God is never going to conform the universe to humans concept of it we need to discover it. Now, most scientists understand that. Most scientists who are looking at the universe have a good understanding of this, un this basic principle that we need to go out and discover what's there. Mm -hmm. And most religious people don't have a good concept of that. Most religious people have a very, very fixed idea about what is in the universe, and they are very opposed, due to their religious belief systems, to discovering new scientific facts. 
And often it has been religion that has opposed the discovery of God's truth, ironically. Yes. So there is religion stating to the world that it is the, you know, the, 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 they are the people who know everything about God's truth. And yet they have been the very people who have been opposed to the discovery of new scientific truth, which is God's truth. So I find that quite ironic in some ways, that often it's religion that has actually uh, been against the discovery of divine truth, God's Mm. truth. And and I find it interesting that when I talk about God's truth, most scientific people have a problem because they most of them believe, you know, do not believe in a God generally. And yet, ironically, I have exactly the same philosophy that they have in terms of the discovery of truth. Yes. With one exception, and that is, I believe there is a creator who knows all truth. And, and also, not only believe, I know for certain mm. through my personal interaction with that creator. And you also mentioned earlier that you have a different process in experimenting in of that you, you would go directly to God. To not a, yes, and then confirm those particular things through my personal experience, of course. So, so like, like a scientist would with regard to the discovery of you know, what you would call physical facts, I do the same with all facts, spiritual, physical, love, emotional, everything, all kinds of facts. They, they are all a part of God's truth. Mm. There are laws that govern the flow of emotion, for example, between one person and another. There's actual physically, physical laws that govern those particular things. They're God's truths. There's physical laws that govern the physical universe. There's physical laws that, dis- that govern what we refer to as the spirit world, which is really just other dimensional existences. There's mathematics that defines them, physical laws that govern them. There's the physical laws that govern the unification of the soul. The physical process of two halves of the soul coming together is all governed by universal law, scientific in nature, logical and mathematical in its basis. All of these things have have the underlying premise that God knows reality and in the end all we're going to do is discover that reality sooner or later. Mm-hmm. Now, if we spend all of our time discovering that reality by experimentation without God, well, that's fine. Eventually, we'll arrive at some truth. But I'm suggesting that if you do it with God, you'll arrive at the truth much more rapidly and much greater truths you'll arrive at much more rapidly as well. So, but that's the only difference between myself and a person who, who has a scientific background. Mm. Mm. And finally, would you say that all of divine truth is actually loving? Always. All divine truth, all of God's universe has been created around loving principles. So truth is always loving. God's truth is always loving. A lot of people on earth don't believe that, of course. And that's one difference between personal truth and divine truth. Uh (laughs) Um, But God's truth is always loving. It's always based on facts. It's always based on logic. But it's always got entwined with it this emotion of love that, that, that flows throughout every single law. It, and in fact, once you understand love, you understand the laws far better as to why they've been created, how they work. And in terms of the discovery of new laws, it's much easier to discover new laws once you understand that all of the laws are based around love. Love. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Yeah. So then what's the importance of divine truth in our lives? Well, this is a great question, I feel, and, and the answer is it's of extreme importance in our life. Like, there, there is only one thing more important in our life, and the only reason why this one thing that's more important is more important is because it affects our happiness and our emotions, and that's love. Uh-huh. So the only thing more important than truth is love. But truth even opens the doorway to love. It opens the doorway to understanding how love interacts with things and how love is involved in the universe and how love is involved in creation and how love is involved in every law. So it's truth that lets us understand everything. And as such, it becomes extremely important, not only for our current existence, for happiness in our current existence, but it also becomes extremely important for everything that's going to happen to us in our future. Mm. It also is important in every aspect of life that we can think about, right the way through from the time of our conception to who knows what happens in in terms of our future. It also is important in every different type of 
thing that we can be interested in. So, so there is little point, for example, in studying the medical profession if you don't understand the truth. <laughs> You know, if, you, if you're told a heap of false things in the medical profession, for example, like 200 years ago, they used to bleed people when they were sick, thinking that would help them and help them get better. Of course it doesn't. We know that now because we've discovered more truth. If you don't know the truth in any single profession, you are in danger of harming not only yourself, but also every single person around you and the universe in which we live. Mm -hmm. so, so knowing the truth is wonderful for helping us understand how everything works and also to reduce the amount of pain and suffering that occurs in our life. Pain and suffering is all the result of people not knowing the truth in the end or not feeling the truth. And so the truth is, divine truth is so essential in those areas as well. And then if you look at the different areas of life, like the medical profession, the political state, state of the earth, the environmental state of the earth, the, the state of each country, what's going on in terms of religion and all these other aspects, um, it's, uh, the, the pain and suffering that results in all of these areas is a complete result of us not understanding all the truth about it. So how does divine truth prevent us from the danger of being harmed and why does it create such a happy life? Well, divine truth creates this, well, creates a number of things, obviously. Firstly, it, because we know the truth, we are not going to take actions that are out of harmony with that truth. This means that we're not going to take actions that are out of harmony with love. Remember, we said divine truth is in harmony with love. The beauty of doing that is that we will never feel pain and suffering if we do that. So all of the pain and suffering that occurs on this planet is the direct result of not knowing enough divine truth. That's the truth. That, that is one single truth about this beautiful uh, divine truth or, or God's truth that we know. Is that without... Uh, humankind has tried for centuries to be without God's truth. As a result of that, we've, we've had much pain and suffering. This pain and suffering is the direct result of our inability to understand all of God's truths. If we understood all of God's truths, we would have less pain and suffering. And that applies in every single walk of life. It's a bit like, for example, if we were planning a trip from Earth to the moon and we didn't know the truth of gravity, then we'd be in a lot of trouble. There's mm -hmm. a high likelihood we'd die trying. Mm -hmm. if we didn't understand the laws that involved with gravity, even, even the laws that involve the computation of the gravitational acceleration that surrounds the Earth and the gravitational acceleration that surrounds the Moon. If we didn't understand those particular laws and mathematics, then we would have next to no chance of arriving at the Moon in the right possible way that we would actually then be able to return to Earth. So the fact that, that historically, in what was it, 1969 it first occurred, there had to be huge numbers of laws, physical laws, that mankind could describe mathematically in order for someone to safely go from here to the moon and back again. So that, now, that's a physical matter. If we look at a medical matter, we can see historically many times physicians did things that were way out of harmony with love, but also way out of harmony with what we now know to be true. And as a result, they had a negative effect rather than a positive effect on the people they were trying to help. That also applies to the political system and the religious system. If we look at the religious system, for example, that we live in currently, we can see that in most religions there is this viewpoint that only people in those religions will be saved. This particular problem, this particular statement, which is an untruth, causes huge numbers of believers and non-believers to get into conflict with each other all the time. As a result, even wars have occurred historically, where millions of people have died as a direct result of this particular belief. Obviously, the belief is false. Right? However, most people of Christian or other religions don't believe it's false. Right? They believe it's true. And as a result of believing something is true, that is actually false, they, they now have engaged in action which has caused pain and suffering to other people and themselves. 
And this is the direct result of every time we're out of harmony with divine truth. Every time we're out of harmony with God's truth, pain and suffering will be the result. The beauty of divine truth is it brings freedom from pain and suffering, not more pain and suffering. So is that why you said that when we know truth, we will act in harmony with it? Is that because we know the truth that acting in disharmony with God's truth will cause pain and suffering? Of course. It will cause us pain and suffering physically, potentially. It can also, and this is something that most people on earth don't understand, is it will cause us pain and suffering emotionally, and it will also cause us pain and suffering spiritually. So it will cause pain and suffering in every, possi- in every aspect of our life if we don't know the truth. Mm-hmm. So when I don't know the truth about love, I will have pain and suffering in my love life. If I don't know truth about religion, I will have pain and suffering or create pain and suffering in my religious life. If I don't know truth about spirituality, I will create pain and suffering spiritual, that, that is spiritual in its nature that will have an emotional impact upon me. If I don't know the truth about the physical universe, whatever I choose to do, I will, I will generally, if I don't act in harmony with what I know to be true or I haven't discovered the truth yet, I will create pain and suffering physically. This is the natural consequence of not understanding all of God's truths. So I feel it is imperative initially to understand some very, very basic truths about our physical existence firstly, and then about our emotional existence next, and then about our spiritual existence. Mm -hmm. And if we do not understand these particular truths, we are going to have pain and suffering. We are going to have emotional trauma, which later on we are going to need to address if we're ever going to be happy. So this is one of the consequences of not knowing divine truth. So, so divine truth, knowing it in your life, is essential for your future everlasting happiness. So why would you avoid its discovery, given the fact that it's so essential for your life? Yeah. yeah. And what about how it relates to our relationship with God? Well, obviously, it relates, God's truth relates to everything, not just to our relationship with God. So, you know, in the beginning, we might not even believe there is a God. Mm-hmm. And, and God's truth will eventually illuminate that particular aspect of itself if we are willing to discover, if we're going, willing to go through a process of experimentation in order to discover whether that is the truth or not. So I'm not saying that we need to guess what the truth is. What we need to do is still go through experiments, but we have the option of firstly going through experiments about whether God exists. Mm -hmm. Once we have determined the truth about that particular subject, then it it becomes much easier to determine the truth about every other subject because if God doesn't exist, then we have to do our personal experiments. If God does exist, then if there's a way to communicate with that God that does exist, then it would make sense that we communicate with that God who does exist and therefore be able to receive truths of the, about the universe that that God has created. Now, I'm not suggesting that a person has to believe that right up front, mm-hmm. but what I am suggesting is that sooner or later, as we've found from our own experience, they will come to the conclusions, if they take those experiments, they will come to the conclusions that the experiments enforce. And that is, sooner or later, they'll come to the conclusion that God does exist. Mm-hmm. And it's much easier to ask God what's going on with God's universe than it is to try and discover the infinite amount of things that are going on in the universe without God. And that's what I'm suggesting. So, so I don't feel that we need to get too hung up on a fact about, even about belief in God when we're discovering universal truth. We need to understand that there is an absolute truth about everything. Once we understand there is an absolute truth about everything, we can then do experiments in order to discover it. The key is to not limit those experiments in any direction until we have discovered certain truths. Like it's like a scientist, it's like almost like saying to a scientist, look, I want you to find a cure to cancer, but you're not allowed to do any experimentation on any living organism. You're not allowed to do any experimentation, you know, communicate with God because we don't believe in God. And you're not allowed to do any communication with spirits. You might be able to tell you the answer because we don't believe in spirits. And you're not allowed to um, 
you know, uh, do any, use any chemical that, you know, might be adverse in its nature towards the human body. And you're not allowed, and we make a whole heap of these rules. It's almost like every rule is like tying somebody's arms behind their back and tying their legs up. And, and then in their set, they now, now go ahead and do an experiment, like mm -hmm. as if that's going to work. And this is, this, this is the unfortunate thing of what we do. I feel the only thing that we need to do when it comes to these experiments is ask ourselves what is loving. That needs to be the only limitation that we place on any experimentation. Mm -hmm. And if we place experimentation, limitations of love on the experimentation, we will eventually find the truth very rapidly. If we don't place limitations of love on the experimentation, we will still eventually find the truth, but it will be with more pain and suffering. Mm -hmm. Because every time we act out of harmony with love, there is always more pain and suffering. So what I would recommend the people to do is to experiment in harmony with love in order to discover more truth. But understand this truth, God's truth, is so important to the rest of your existence that it needs to be of primary focus in your life. You know, forget, you know, chasing the next thing, like the next fastest car and the next new technological advance. These things are very minor in comparison to discovering more and more of God's truth because it is discovering of God's truth that is going to lead you to a happy and universally growing infinite existence if you decide to go down that track. So, so I feel it's, it's so, such an essential part of a person's future life. Mm. So then just to summarise the different things that you've said about the importance of divine truth mm -hmm. in our lives, basically you're saying it's what leads us to have an ever-expanding expa um, curiosity yes. and desire to discover things. So therefore a passion to, for life. Like, you know, if, if we knew everything after a while and we decided not to create anything as a, as a part of that or we couldn't create anything but we knew everything, after a while, we'd start wondering what there is to do unless there were some emotional experiences that are going to be new. Right. And this is what divine truth allows us to do is because God's truth is always in expanding and it's infinite in its nature. We are always going to be discovering more and always be more fascinated. And as a result of that, we will have a very interesting life. So we're going to have a happy life and an interesting life mm -hmm. if we understand God, uh, God's truth. And... Um, that it will free us. And From the bondage of uh, not only... What, what I would view as the bondage of slavery. And when I talk about slavery, I'm not talking about slavery in terms of a human being enslaved by another human. I'm talking about slavery to false beliefs. That is our biggest slavery here on the planet. We have, a whole, we have constructed a myriads, millions, of, in fact, of false beliefs some religious, some scientific, some or, you know, of all kinds of uh, natures. They're beliefs, they're not facts yet. And yet we've turned them into what we believe to be fact. Mm -hmm. And in doing so, we have become enslaved by our own ideas and concepts. If we're progressing towards divine truth, we don't do that. Divine truth creates freedom. It doesn't create slavery to false beliefs and ideas. It doesn't create slavery to the history of mankind. Mm. It, it is forward-looking and not reverse-looking. Mm. It doesn't try to fit everything into the past. It tries to construct a new future. It's exciting. Yeah. yeah. And I suppose the final thing is that it's only God's truth that allows us to receive God's love, isn't of it? Of course. So without God's truth or a desire for it, we're never going to be able to receive divine love. If we don't know the truth about God's existence, for example, and, cannot, and do not know the truth about what experiments we can undertake, then it's going to be very, very hard for us to eventually receive God's love. So, so in the end, our own personal soul's ability to expand beyond its original creation is completely dependent upon understanding divine truth, understanding mm -hmm. God's truth. So it's, it's so essential in every aspect of a person's life. That's why it's been our primary fascination for 2,000 years. We're not interested in much else, actually, as people find out when they start talking to us. Although we have a lot of uh, passions and desires and interests in all sorts of things, in the end, our very primary interest, and it's much, much higher than any other interest, is our interest in discovering more truth, more divine truth, more God's truth. Hmm. Okay. 
Are there ways to recognise divine truth? Definitely. Divine truth has definite ways of recognising it. Divine truth has attributes and characteristics. And while many of these attributes and characteristics, there, there are many hundreds of these attributes and characteristics, you could probably list, you know, 15 to 20 of them and discuss them. And I think that's probably what we need to do in these sessions is to list 15 or 20 of the attributes mm -hmm. and characteristics and then discuss those attributes and characteristics about how they define God's truth. The reason why we need to know that it has attributes and characteristics is because we need to recognise divine truth versus human truth. We need to see the difference because they're not the same thing. Divine truth has certain attributes and characteristics that are not contained in our own personal truth or in human, humanity created truth. And once we understand the flavour, if you like, of divine truth, then we have this beautiful ability to recognise it whenever it appears in our life. Because it always has a unique type of attribute and characteristic and quality that human truth doesn't have. So it's sort of like a benchmark or a, 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 a filter that we can test new ideas yes. through. Yes, and they are very simple filters that are logical to understand. That's the, that's the thing that I find very interesting, mm -hmm. is that people on earth believe it's so difficult to discover God's truth. But the reality is all of God's truths have a certain flavour to them. They have certain attributes and characteristics that are not present in humanity-created truth. So a lot of the religious truth on the planet, once you examine it through the eyes of these particular attributes and qualities, you, you can dismiss much of it because you can see immediately that it can't be true, mm -hmm. right? Through just some logical statements, it cannot be true, in fact. But, but once we analyse all some of the different flavours of the qualities of divine truth, you can see there's emotion involved and everything. So there's a lot of different things involved in the flavours and attributes and characteristics of God's truth. So what I quite often liken it to is it's almost like a, it's like a dish, I suppose you could say, a meal, you know, that you're having. Now, some meals that people have, uh, that people create, are pretty terrible, actually. You know, they're almost inedible. And we find that particularly when we're a vegan because it's like people give us things and go, how? I don't know how you can eat that. And we go, we, I don't know how we can eat that either. Or we, how you can how think you that can this is what we usually that that's eat. what we eat. Yeah. <laughs> and because there's no flavour, there's no, you know, there's a certain flavour once you start to create with spices and all these different things. Now, it's the same with regard to God's truth versus human truth. God's truth have, has all these unique types of flavours and spices, if you like, to it, or what, what I would classify as attributes and characteristics or attributes and qualities that you can list, in fact, and apply to each human created truth to determine whether it's a part of God's truth or not. And once you have that list of attributes and qualities of truth that are all logical and easy to understand, you can then look at the human created truth, the, the human ideas that, that people say are truth but are not often truth, and we can apply each attribute and characteristic to it. And when we apply those attributes and characteristics, we can see, no, it doesn't fit. It doesn't fit the mould, if you like, of what God's truth is all about because each of God's truths has certain attributes and characteristics. And so I feel it's very, very important to have a discussion about what the attributes and characteristics of divine truth are. Mm -hmm. And if people can understand them and see how they can apply them in their personal life, they'll be able to quickly identify a truth in comparison to floundering around, you know, yeah. or foundering around. <laughs> Uh, in the darkness, you know, always not knowing. Because, you know, and there are so many things that people on earth want to believe are true, but once you apply a few of these characteristics to, to what they want to believe, you can see they cannot be true for, for very, very simple reasons. So, um, so these attributes and characteristics then become, if you think about it, one of the, some of the most important things you could ever understand mm -hmm. and ever apply. And this is where I feel a lot of people who have heard divine truth for years, you know, they've listened to our presentations, listened to the different uh, explanations of different things. They still do not understand these basic characteristics of divine truth, the basic attributes of it. And as a result, they still ask a lot of questions they don't need to ask anymore. 
once you understand completely the attributes and characteristics of divine truth, there's only a few questions you have to ask in order to determine whether something can be true or not. Mm -hmm. and, and that is wonderful because it helps you filter out all of the ideas and concepts of humanity, of which there are millions of books written. Yes. And you're able to filter all that out and work out which bits can actually uh, are worth even listening to based upon the attributes and characteristics of divine truth. And I think that's a wonderful thing. Yes. And if a person who is studying divine truth just did that, they would have an amazing changes, amazing changes in their personal life. They'd have amazing changes in their understanding of the universe around them. They'd also have amazing changes within their soul that would start to occur as a result of just understanding these basic attributes and qualities and having a grasp of them from a feeling from an emotional perspective. So they'd have to have both a logical or intellectual and emotional understanding of these particular qualities and attributes. Once that happens, it's very, very hard after that to feed them an untruth, to feed them an error, and they actually go along with it. Because, because every error that comes along, you can go, does this match that? Does this match that quality? Does this match that quality? And if you and you only really need 15 or 20 of these qualities or attributes of divine truth to know whether something's right or wrong, right from the beginning, and whether it, whether it, whether it invites more of your investigation or whether you can dismiss it almost immediately is determined by whether it matches some of these very basic qualities of God's truth. Great. Well, we'll have to discuss them in later questions. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And in fact, if people refer to the later sessions, uh, that we have on divine truth, they'll see, we'll list each quality that we list, and, and the qualities are not exhaustive. The, the attributes are not exhaustive. We're not creating an exhaustive list because there are many things that we could add to it. But if we list 15 or 16 primary ones and show you how the person can apply that to all sorts of issues in their day-to-day -day life, they'll get an understanding. And once they have that understanding, it's very easy to determine truth after that. Great. Mm. All right. Most people believe there's no such thing as absolute truth. Each person has their own opinion or their own version of the truth. Mm -hmm. And we often hear people saying things like, that's your truth, it's not my truth. Mm. What would you say in response to statements like this? Um, all of those statements are false, <laughs> actually, is what I would say. There is such a thing as absolute truth. Now... I find it quite remarkable that people try to assume that there's not, when if you look at the very creations, the very things upon which our lives in a modern environment are dependent upon, every single thing is dependent upon an absolute truth. So, for example, when I fly from here to the other side of Australia, I am putting my life in the hands of a number of discovered absolute truths. I'm putting my life in the discovery of an absolute truth regarding aerodynamics. I'm putting my life in the discovery of the laws of aerodynamics and that the people who are flying my plane understand those laws <laughs> and the people who designed my plane understand those laws. Because if they don't, the plane's going to fall out of the sky. Yes. And I'm putting my very trust in it. So... So I find it remarkable that almost everybody on the planet does accept that when it comes to physical laws, there is an absolute truth. So, for example, there is an absolute truth about the law of gravity. There is an absolute truth about the law of aerodynamics. There's an absolute truth about some of the laws of physics that they've discovered, the laws of acceleration, calculation of speed, all of these things. We have devices that are completely based around these laws. Mm -hmm. We have GPS units which flick a signal back to a satellite and back down to tell us exactly where we are. And those GPS units can be made because of the law, the law that man has discovered. So these are devices that are all based upon absolute truth. Right? They're all based upon the absolute truth of physical-based laws of the universe that God has created, God's truths. They're all based on God's truths. I find it interesting, though, that when it comes to emotional issues and soul-based issues and feelings and experiences, 
everyone then throws out that fact. They throw out the fact that there is an absolute truth about everything. They then go, oh, but that's my personal experience. And what I'm suggesting to them is, no, you have your personal experience, I agree, but that doesn't make it the truth. God's truth is that God can see your personal experience and knows the exact reason why your personal experience is actually occurring, given all of the laws of the universe right at this particular point or moment in time. That being the case, God knows the absolute truth of why and what is happening in your life right now. This then also makes to God your life completely predictable. <laughs> In other words, God knows every single law, laws that we have yet to discover, laws that we do not know, God knows, because God created them all. God knows every single thing that governs your particular life right now. Even the level of your own happiness is governed by a law, actually. And we don't believe that. The reason why we don't believe that is because we believe it with physical things. Like, so, so when it comes to GPS units and computers and satellites and and navigation and all these physical matters, we believe it then. And then for some reason, I don't, and I still don't really understand what it is because it's not what I do personally, but for some reason most of humanity throws out that fact when it comes to their emotional life, when it comes to their general happiness and well-being, when it comes to what is going on on the earth itself and the, and the pain and suffering that's existing on the earth itself. They don't believe that it's got anything to do with law, but it does. It's got everything to do with the fact that we don't know the absolute truth, yes. God's truth about those particular things. And we need to discover it as soon as we possibly can in order to reduce the pain and suffering that we're in. And if we use a practical example of that, going on what you spoke about earlier about the importance of divine truth in our lives, you said that it actually leads to less pain and suffering mm. and to more happiness and more harmony. So if you and I have an interaction where there's a disagreement and I say, well, you attacked me and you say, well, you attacked me and that's your truth and that's my, truth, my truth and whatever. <laughs> yeah. and, um, what you're really saying is there is an absolute truth about what went on. Exactly. Neither of us might actually and neither understand might not, it. neither of us might know it. Yes. But God does. But God <laughs> does. And then implicit in that, you're sort of saying that we can discover it. Yes, because there's laws involved in it. And if we do discover it, yep. there'll be more happiness. Of course. So wouldn't the reason why people don't want to uh, happen upon this truth is that and want to hold on to this idea that I've got my truth and you've got your truth... Isn't it just about fear and a lack of humility, not wanting to face certain things about ourselves well, or others? I, yeah, there, if we, of course I understand the emotional reasons why a person would choose such an action. There are all sorts of emotional reasons why. But, but literally millions <laughs> of emotional reasons why, unfortunately, mm -hmm. because of their background and how they've been brought up and how their attitude is to life and whether they're in rebellion or whether they're in acceptance. or yeah. all, all sorts of different emotions yeah. would cause them to throw out these facts. But even with all those emotions, it doesn't make sense to throw out this one fact. When it comes to physical things, we believe there's laws. We know there's laws that create an absolute truth. And our very lives, we make our very lives dependent upon them, in fact. So, so when I place myself in the hands of a pilot, I am making my very life dependent upon somebody's understanding of absolute truth. God's truth. Why is it then that I don't apply that to my emotional life, my soul-based life? And I feel the only reason why we don't is because we don't wish to see that all of these emotional things that we feel are also governed by laws, are also governed by facts, are also governed by facts that are not under our current understanding that we can discover. We don't want to do that. And yet we have completely the opposite attitude to the physical facts. And there is one primary reason why we have that different attitude. And that is, with the physical facts, we usually have little emotional investment, investment mm. in them. When it comes to the emotional facts and happiness and all these other factual parts, the soul-based parts of our life, we have huge emotional investments in holding on to our current positions. And that's what causes us to throw out the logic. 
we throw away the logical thought. If there's physical laws that govern my physical existence, then there must be laws that govern my love-based existence. There must be laws that govern my spiritual existence. There must be laws that govern my emotional existence. And all I need to do is do what I do with my physical existence and apply those particular things that I do to my physical existence to these other parts of my existence. In other words, I've got a large desire to find out all of the physical laws. Why don't I have a large desire to discover all the emotional laws? And why don't I have a large desire to discover all the spiritual laws? It makes no sense, logically. Because logically, when I discover the physical laws, my life gets better, it's more interesting, it's more fascinating, it becomes more economical, I can go all places around the world with less time, I can have a larger experience, I generally have more happiness, generally. I have more engagement a lot of the times, not all the time, but it depends. But all of those things happen when I discover more physical laws. Logically, the same thing would apply if I discover my emotional laws. All those things would happen to an even greater extent. And if I discovered spiritual laws, all of the same things would happen to an even greater extent. Logically, that would make sense. And yet people throw away the concept that absolute truth exists emotionally and spiritually. They only believe absolute truth exists physically. And I find that remarkable. So what I'm suggesting is absolute truth does not only exist physically. It exists emotionally, spiritually. It exists in every facet of our life. God has made laws that we can discover that are absolute truths about the, our life and how we live our life. This is the most fascinating thing about our life. It's not just governed by these physical laws. It's governed by all these other laws that we don't know and have yet to discover. Most of people on earth have yet to discover. And yet, if we engage them, we will find, just like when we engage our physical laws, we, everything becomes happier and more experiential and, and, more, and, and, and we have a greater, more fulfilling existence generally. So too, when we discover the laws involved in our emotional and spiritual well-being, will have an even greater effect on our personal happiness and existence. So I feel that's the thing for people to understand is this, uh, I feel there's a large amount of illogical reasoning when it comes to law. We, we seem to reason logically when it comes to the physical laws, but when it comes to the spiritual, emotional laws, we throw them all out of the window. We say, oh, that's my truth. Mm -hmm. And that's not, not thinking that because each physical law has a God's truth element, has a universal, absolute truth element to it, that eventually every person on earth has to accept if we're going to engage that law, so too does every emotional and spiritual law have a God's truth to it, an absolute truth, an element that we all will need to come to see at some point that it is true. Mm -hmm. and, and eventually we will if we engage the process. Lovely, yeah. thank you. Most people believe in shades of grey or <laughs> yes. white lies yeah. and that white lies are acceptable mm -hmm. and even necessary. Mm -hmm. What do you feel about that? Well, I can see from a human perspective that people believe in shades of grey. Um, you know, that there are what things that are black and there's things that are white and then there's a lot of things in between and they don't like people who are black and white generally and in terms of, you know, the way in which they analyse situations. They like people to have this shades of grey or the feeling of compromise, I suppose, is what it, cre it encourages. With regard to white lies, that's what white lies do too. It encourages compromise on the truth. God never compromises on truth. God's truths are fixed and immovable. We can't change them. And in fact, God never wishes to. And God has actually created them in such a way me in such a way that they cannot be changed. They can only be embraced or ignored, mm -hmm. but they can't be changed. Now, on earth, what we often want to do with truth is change it. If we look at history, you know, that's why we now call it his story, isn't it? Like, rather than history, because it's somebody's story, which usually has been changed from the actual facts of what actually occurred. 
there is very little desire, even in most personal relationships, for the individuals in each relationship to actually discover the actual truth about themselves and discover the actual truth about their partner. There are many people currently in relationships who don't want to know if their partner's cheated on them, for example, because they don't want to deal with the pain and suffering that it might expose. So my feelings are, if we really, really understand this element of, or quality of divine truth in that it's fixed and immovable, we will see that truth is black and white. There is no shades of grey from God's perspective. God knows that it is what it is and nothing can change that. What we need to do, rather than try to you know, reason that there's all these shades, is we need to see that whenever we're thinking in shades, you know, or feeling in shades of grey with regard to truth, we are out of harmony with one aspect of divine truth, one aspect of one quality of divine truth, and that is that it's immovable. Mm -hmm. Once we discover the actual truth, all the shades of grey disappear and we only have light. We only have the light of truth shown on that particular subject. We know exactly what it is after that point. So any person who in their personal life believes that shades of grey are fine and in their personal life believes that white lies are fine, I suggest to them that they don't understand a quality of absolute truth and that is absolute truth is always black and white as the saying goes. There is always the absolute truth and only the absolute truth. It is fixed, immovable, nothing can change it and unless you want that, you're going to keep thinking that everything is shades of grey and as a result of the shades of grey, you're going to have pain and suffering that comes along from you not accepting that the absolute truth is fixed and immovable. And also from what you've <coughs> said in previous answers that the absolute truth actually brings less pain and suffering. Of course. If most we practice it, you know, we can work against it. Sure. But if we practice it and live in harmony with it, it will always bring less pain and suffering. Yeah, and so when most people say... I told a white lie to save that person's feelings, basically to save pain and suffering. You didn't save anything. We're not... Um, that's in an avoidance of the, God's truth about that subject. And it's also an avoidance of pain and suffering. Because what, what happens is that God's truth will always expose an error. Pain and suffering comes from the errors, not from the truth. It's only when the error exists within a person on some subject, they believe something that's not true. Once they come to accept the truth, it's going to be pain and suffering, not because of the truth itself, but because of the error they believe they had to let go of. So, for example, if I believe that my partner is faithful and yet she's not, then I will have pain and suffering as a result of the belief of the error that I have. Mm -hmm. The truth is she is not in that moment, you know, she has not been. And once I come to accept the truth, I will actually have less pain and suffering. I will understand what's been going on in my relationship better. I'll understand that I didn't have as close relationship with the person as what I believed. I'll understand the reasons why. There's all sorts of new things I can discover by accepting this fact. Yeah, so you're saying that we use white lies actually to avoid pain and suffering. Correct. Um, but not in the way... It's more about... We use our, white lies to avoid our own pain. Our and own pain and suffering. Always, yes. always. And in fact, we use sh the whole concept of shades of grey to avoid our own pain and suffering of coming to a consciousness of our own error. Every time we come to a consciousness of our own error, there will be pain and suffering. Once we let go of it, it'll be gone. Once we're living in harmony with truth completely, there will be no pain and suffering anymore because we now have the complete truth. Mm -hmm. So, for example, people often, you know, ask me, well, what happens with regard to trust, you know? Well, I know who to trust because I can feel through the truth of who is willing to compromise the truth. People who are willing to compromise truth, I know that I can't trust them. <laughs> it's as simple as that. Mm -hmm. And so when somebody comes up to me wanting to be trusted and I know they cannot be trusted because they're willing to compromise truth, I don't trust them. So when they do something, you know, that might be negative towards me or bad, I don't also feel disappointed because I know that they were going to do that given their condition. That's because 
I understand there's absolute truth and then there's the people who are out of harmony with absolute truth. People who are out of harmony with absolute truth will always be unable to be trusted on those particular subjects that they're out of harmony with truth on. Mm -hmm. You can't trust them. That's the truth. <laughs> <laughs> because they don't understand this basic fundamental principle that once you become in harmony completely with truth, then everything becomes able to be assessed. Everything is able to be examined. The, it shines the light on everything. And that's why often in the Bible, there's the, the, the concept that truth is like a light showing the way. And it is. It's like having a flashlight in a darkened room. Truth is like that. It exposes what's in the room. And uh, without it, you don't have exposed what is in the room. And it's fantastic to expose what's in the room because then you know where everything is, what the situation is, what you can trust, what you can't trust, where you can go, what you can't do, what you can do. You know everything. You can make better choices based on truth. You can make better choices. Yeah. yeah. Whereas if everyone comes to the room with all of their white lies and nobody wants to expose Which any truth. Which means there's no light in the room. It was all yes. shades of grey everywhere. And all of the chairs, tables and all the other things that are in the room could be tripped over, fell over, tripped upon, hit, hit against. And potentially you could die in the room <laughs> if you didn't know what was in the room, right? Yeah. And, what, and, and you ran into some corner and got hit on a corner or something in the wrong spot. You know, but once you have the light of truth in that room, now your existence is much safer, it is much easier, is much, you have much more freedom, you have much more understanding, you can also have much more compassion. So there's also a heap of emotions now that you can have. So, so I would always encourage people to, to always gravitate towards truth. Gra you know, instead of going back to the white lies and going back to the shades of grey, always understand that truth is like a bright light that keeps getting brighter because it's going to be infinitely expanding. So it's going to keep getting brighter. But it's like a bright light that keeps getting brighter as your days progress, if you like. And therefore you see more, you understand more, you, you know what to do more. You understand how to exercise your free will inside of that truth now in a manner that is not going to create pain and suffering for yourself or other people. Mm -hmm. So we might <coughs> use white lies to avoid truth in the short term, but mm -hmm. ultimately things will become more painful. Exactly. And if well, it's, we... like, it's like turning off the flashlight in a room full of things. Why would you want to do that? All you're going to end up with is tripping over a lot of it, yeah, <laughs> which exactly. is what people finish up doing. Yeah. 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 Okay, thank you. Mm. Another reason why I feel people do this, this thing of you know, having white lies or you know, wanting to believe in shades of grey and so forth, is that they are constantly in fear in the end of truth. They're afraid of truth. And logically, there is no good reason to be afraid of truth. If there's anything to be afraid of, it's error, not truth. <laughs> like, and there's no logical good, re logical good reason for uh, being afraid of truth. Fr truth is only going to help you in your life. It's not going to harm you. And I, and I don't understand, uh, uh, when I say I don't understand, from a logical perspective, you, there is really no good reason for rejecting truth, right? From an emotional reason... There are millions of reasons why a person might reject truth, but none of, but all of that is just an avoidance of a specific emotion. So the main reason why people avoid truth, of course, is because they're avoiding a specific emotion that exposing the error would create in them. And that's all they're trying to avoid. So I find that's quite sad. And we, we find a lot of people are very afraid of divine truth for that reason. They're very afraid of coming along to a seminar for that reason. They're very afraid of what might get exposed. They, they even don't talk to us, you and I, as you know, mm -hmm. because they're afraid of what AJ might say or Jesus might say to them. So I feel the majority of people who are afraid of what I might say to them have a, an illogical viewpoint with regard to truth. It makes no sense to be afraid of somebody giving you a light. Mm -hmm. and exposing the world around you, the room I in which agree. you live. Yes. Right? It only may, and yet, I, I find quite remarkable, the opposite often occurs. We're not afraid of the people who want us to remain in darkness. 
at the same time, we're afraid of, the, of somebody who wants to give us a light. <laughs> and, uh, and obviously, you know, God is always attempting to give us the light of God's truth, the light of absolute truth in our lives every single moment. And so if we honour that, we will not revert to the shades of grey thinking or the, or the white lies thinking. We will want to honour the fact that it's only the truth that is going to make our life easier. It's only the truth that is going to result in our freedom. Lovely. Hmm. Although most people lie, most people also feel hurt when they find out about the lies of others. Of course, yes. <laughs> Why does this happen? Perhaps it's not of course. Why does this happen? <laughs> Well, inbuilt in our soul is this affinity to truth. There is this feeling inside of the majority of people that as far as it affects their own absorption of experience, that they would like to have truth told to them. And when we're lied to, we often become very hurt as a result. The, the hurt, of course, is not because of the truth that is now exposed, right? but it is because the lie has been exposed and, it, and it's a betrayal of truth that we're feeling. And there is this quality or attribute of our own existence of the human soul that we want to hear the truth at some level. And in fact, even the most accomplished liar becomes very, very upset when they're lied to, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> which is an indication of their own hypocrisy in the end. But they are very afraid of having lies told to them. Now, the reason why we are afraid of having lies told to us and then having them exposed is because in the end we do have at the core of our existence an understanding that lies result in a more difficult existence, that false or error, anything that's false or in error, will mean that we'll have more pain and suffering in our future once it's exposed. And, and so the majority of us know at some level that the right thing to do is to focus on telling the truth. Mm -hmm. Now we know that because of the personal pain we experience when somebody doesn't tell us the truth. That's how we know it. So we can see that when somebody doesn't tell us the truth and we find out, we feel hurt and we feel pain as a result, which is the direct result of the error being exposed. So let's just, let's just break that down a little bit because mm. you said a lot of exposed and a lot of error and a mm. lot of truth and a lot of lies and it you <laughs> know, can yeah. get very, you need to be very intellectually engaged with what you just said. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um. well, the, 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 uh, the thing I find interesting about all these conversations is most people find it difficult to follow them not because they are incapable of intellectual engagement. It's because they are incap not capable of logically, emotionally, emotional understanding. And the reason why they're not is because they have internal emotional justification for the error that exists within them. And as a result, they are resistive to hearing a truth, which means that you're not open logically. Logically, you'll find... It difficult to understand things. When we, when we have an emotional investment in avoiding something, exactly. this makes us illogical or it, it creates an investment in, uh, in discarding our of, logic. In our own lack of logic, yes, yes, yes it does. Yes. 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 But just to, just to be clear about the cause of pain, mm -hmm. when, when somebody lies, say you lied to me, yep. and then I discovered the lie, mm -hmm. you're saying to me that the pain is not... Because the truth. I now know the truth. No. Say you said, I'm wearing red socks today and I discovered you're wearing blue socks. Yeah. And then uh, the pain wouldn't be that you're wearing red socks. No. It's be that you told me you were wearing blue instead of red. In other words, I lied to you, which that is a betrayal. So, so the, the pain, pain is a result of betrayal. Is a result of betrayal, a feeling, an emotion. Yet I might be lying to you uh, every minute of every day, mm -hmm. but when I discover you lied to me, I feel pain. Mm. So this is That's because... hypocrisy. <laughs> yes. And basically this question is saying that 
just about everyone's a hypocrite because most people lie and most people feel sadness when they discover others yeah, have lied. Yeah, and this is an indication of the lack of ethics that exists on the planet. Yeah. If we were ethically motivated, we would understand that if I lie regularly in my, day, in my life, then it would make sense that everyone around me probably is doing the same thing. <laughs> yeah. And also, ethically, if I allow myself to lie, then surely, ethically, I should also allow everyone else to lie to me. Now, the fact that I don't means that I'm unethical. Mm -hmm. if, if I am willing to allow myself to get away with a lie, while at the same time want the lies of others to be punished, then I'm unethical. And therefore, I'm not in harmony with truth at all. I either need to choose what I want to do. Do I want to tell the truth myself and therefore I can ethically expect anybody else around me to tell the truth from a pure point of ethics? By the way, once, uh, once I know the truth, I won't expect everyone around me to tell the truth because I'll know when they're lying <laughs> and I'll know why they're lying and I'll understand the underlying emo emotional motivations for their lies. I'll understand all of it. And so therefore I won't believe everything I hear automatically because I will be sensitive to all of those things once I am in connection with the truth myself. But I would not allow myself to lie knowing that it could harm another person. Allowing yourself to lie is like turning off a light in a room. Everyone's going to trip over all the things in the room after yeah. that point. Yeah. Sooner or later that's what happens. When we allow ourselves to tell the truth on all occasions, it's like turning on the light in a room. Everyone now can see what the problem is and therefore has the ability and chance to do something about it. Mm -hmm. So basically you're saying we hurt, we often lie, but we feel hurt when others lie. And that's because one, our souls are designed to be more attuned with truth. Yes. And presumably we lie because we just want to avoid some pain that the truth might expose. Yes, and that's the sad thing is we sort of see the truth as being the cause of the pain. But it's not the truth that's the cause of the pain. For example, if, if, if somebody told you the truth, uh, your husband doesn't cheat on you and that was the truth, well, wouldn't you be happy about that? <laughs> of course you'd be happy about that, right? But if somebody told you the truth, your husband doesn't cheat on you, and, and later on you found out that he did and that they knew yes. he did, you'd be very, very hurt, would you not? So, so the reality is most of the time we justify the lie not under, as, a, as a way of avoiding pain, but it doesn't avoid pain. It doesn't. It's only the truth that allows us to avoid pain if we live in harmony with it. Mm -hmm. When we live out of harmony with it, then of course it causes pain. Right? But it's only the truth that it can allow us to live in harmony with the truth and therefore have freedom without pain. So I feel that there's a big misunderstanding on the planet about, you know, the, there's this whole thing, you know, the truth hurts. No, lies hurt. <laughs> truth doesn't hurt. And, and I suppose there's that, um, that other thing that perhaps we haven't fully explained is that pain already exists within us mm. and our investment in lying comes from wanting to avoid that pain. Yeah, it's a protection and, of, of our own pain that already exists. Yeah, so yeah. It's, the truth is only, as you said, shining a light on something that's already there. Yes, and God's truth is going to shine the biggest light. <laughs> it's, so, the, it's the floodlight. It's yeah. like a floodlight. <laughs> it's like the light of, whole, of day, the sun, you know, being <laughs> shown on the problem. And that's the beauty of it is it shows you everything, the things that you can correct, but also the things that are good. So it shows you everything. And that's why we need to have a much stronger love of it than, than we do on the planet at the moment. And if we look at our own individual lives, the majority of, of us are still afraid of receiving truth. You know, there's a difference between being attacked and receiving truth, um, obviously. Yeah. You know, if a person is just attacking us and telling us that we look bad and all of this, that's not being truthful at all. The truth is they're angry, you know, and, and, and bitter us. and want to hurt yeah, us. That's yeah. the truth. But uh, when, when a person is sincerely interested in truth, it can help our life immensely, you know? Yeah. 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 Great. Mm. Okay. Thank you.